Hey, Stuart. Welcome. Uh, yeah, hi. Can you hear me okay? I can. Good. Thank you so much. Sorry it's so late. <laughs> uh, yeah. Or so uh, early. I can't, yeah, I can't decide whether it's a late night or an early start, to be honest. <laughs> I've got hot coffee. We're okay. Yep. I just had a cup of tea, so we're, we're backwards. I'm drinking tea and you're drinking coffee. <laughs> Uh, I think I'm all set with um, with everything here. Um, okay. We've got another 10 minutes before the meeting actually starts. Um, sure. We'll probably have a few openings and comments, and then we'll, since it is early for you, we'll get turned over to you. And then we actually have, if you care to stick around, we have some, uh, our youth scholarship uh, kids are going to be doing some presentations. We, okay. um, we do a lot of youth scholarship as part of our organization, so. So is it winter time in the UK then? Are your bees snuggled it's, away? Yeah, yeah, it's uh, it's all fairly quiet at the moment. Um, uh, we're, I guess we're around 40 degrees Fahrenheit at the moment, daytime temperatures. So um, yeah, it's fairly cool for us, but being on the eastern side of the UK, it tends to be reasonably mild for us most of the time. <clears throat> Uh, so it's not, um, you know, we don't see a great deal of snow or anything like that, really. Okay. What's, because you're somewhat coastal, right? I mean, is, do you have a lot of humidity issues? Not really. Um, I guess the biggest issue is over winter when we, we tend to get quite a bit of damp in the, the colonies. So that, that can play a part in a negative way. Um, but we are seeing more and more uh, warmer and drier summers uh, and being on the eastern side of the UK we tend to get more of the drier weather so that that's had an impact but um, nothing too serious really good well I'm going to share my screen only because of for those people that don't know where Norfolk United Kingdom is <laughs> uh, sure yeah I, I had a map um, but I pulled oh, up as well. You go ahead. If you... Yeah, unless yours actually has you more isolated, but but yeah, you're. I just wondered if being on the coast here. Yeah. So, um, am I hooked up to to share? Um, Robert, can you make sure that Stuart is a co-host? Oh, he should be able to share. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. And for what it's worth, if you haven't looked already, this is kind of, this is, this is the, so we are the Northeast Kansas beekeepers group. So we're all up okay. in this Kansas city. This is kind of, so we're smack dab in the middle of the country. Yeah. So I, I, um, I need to, I need to boot you off screen yep. sharing in order to share. Um, so let's see if, um, so, a good test anyway. so you guys are up here yeah uh yes yeah right there where it says kansas city that's sort okay. of our so uh if i pull out there and just spin it around actually my daughter lives in um state college at pennsylvania uh, with her husband uh, so spin it around So we have London here, and I live in a city of Norwich, <clears throat> just up here. Um, so we're, we're about 20 miles from the coast, I guess. So what's the body of water? So what, yeah, so my wife's asking, what's the body of water off to the right there? Is that a, is that a? Yeah, so that's the North Sea. North Sea. Yeah. North Sea, okay. Uh, so if I come down here, um so dover which you may have heard of um and then france the coastline of france is here so we're you know, it's a, a very short short trip across the north sea 
Is that by ferry? Uh, the channel too. Yeah, or um, if you're one of the um, migrants dinghy or canoe at the moment, <laughs> uh, it seems to be quite a popular route. Um, it's one of the busiest, if not the busiest shipping lane in the world, as I understand it. Um, and how those people are willing to put themselves in a little dinghy and try and cross is uh, is beyond me, really. Now, is that the one they swim across too? Is that like the yeah. English Channel? Yeah, yeah. okay. Uh, so from my my perspective, I, I keep bees around the, the city of Norwich. So we have bees probably within a 10 or 15 mile radius of, of the city. And then we, we come down, uh, I guess almost um, fairly close to, to London. We, we pollinate uh, a crop of um, borage. I don't know if you guys are familiar with borage. Uh, it's <clears throat> oh, used... we call it, I think we call it phacelia. Is that the same thing as phacelia? Uh, no, phacelia is a different plant. So okay. um, it's sometimes called star flower because of okay. the shape of the flower. Um, but it's used uh, predominantly in the pharmaceutical industry. They crush the seeds for oil, gives a very fine grade oil. And um, we try where we can to have paid pollination, but there's so many beekeepers in such a small space that farmers generally tend to find that they can get beekeepers to put their bees on their crops without paying. Um, uh, so it's a, it's always a, a battle to try and get them to to pay up some some money to to have our bees there, but it does pr produce a, a fairly decent crop of honey. So uh, we we take what we can really. So now, you know, one thing that we find a, I think that's a little unique is that here in the U.S., consumers are very um more into liquid honey you know that doesn't have any you know that's not granulated but i think in, in in europe it's more common for you guys to have the thicker i don't even know if you cream it or if it just naturally crystallizes is that the case for you yeah, there? So, uh, in the spring we have a crop um it, i guess um canola is is your version uh, oilseed rape is what we term it yeah um, it's big in canada yeah and that produces a, um, a high glucose honey, and it's the glucose that sets really quickly. So um, anything that has high glucose in it will, will set very rapidly and, and quite freely. So we, we tend to use that for, for creamed honey. Uh, and we, we do cream it. We, you know, we go through a, a specific process of creaming, uh, and it produces a really, a, a really nice honey. I, personally it's one of my favorites it's it takes the most time and it's probably the least popular M most people still go for for runny honey here in the uk that tends to be the the most popular yeah i know ian i'm assuming you watch ian stepler on youtube a lot because that's his primary I mean, yeah. the canadian beekeeper i mean, I know he talks about the canola like he has to get it extracted within a couple of days or it'll crystallize in the in the exactly brain. that yeah 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 it, it either gets extracted literally as it comes off the hive or it's left and we we cut the comb out of the frames and then melt it down and separate the wax from the, the honey cool Anybody else have any off topic questions for Stuart before we get started? Since I've been asking <laughs> lots of questions, but well, I'll give uh, somebody else I a chance. I don't have a question. I don't have a question. If you can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Hi, Bill. Yes. But um, I, I wanted the speaker to know that my family, for quite a few generations, uh, were from the uh, Sea Pauling area, from Winterton okay. up to King's Lynn. Okay. Yeah. My last, no, name well. is, my last name is Warns. And I don't have to tell them how to pronounce it when I'm over there. <laughs> <laughs> my, my, my triple great grandfather owned the mill, the mill at, right. at Sea Pauling. 
and no see Pauling really well. Uh, my uh, grandparents come from a, a village called Buxton, which is um, just north of Norwich. And uh, see Pauling was a regular summer um, trip for us to go and sit on the beach and swim and have picnics, that kind of thing. So, yeah, I know it well. Lovely part of the countryside. Well, I just wanted to chime in and tell you that it's just, I mean, I, I'm just like flabbergasted that I'm watching something from someone. <laughs> it's a small world, over, isn't it? Oh, I mean, I went over there in 1985 and uh, I was treated very well and got to see the area very well. Great. Uh, it's it's a beautiful area and uh, out, or out where the family was from, uh, it would have been a good place to raise bees, <laughs> you know, it was the country. We're, yeah. we're very lucky in, in Norfolk. So Norwich is in, we have counties and uh, Norfolk is our county. And it's, it's very rural for the most part. So um, it doesn't take long to get to London and to be in the, the capital city and everything that that brings. Um, but it's always nice to come back home into the, the slower paced county of Norfolk. We joke that we need a passport to get out of the county. It's it's so rural, um, but you know, one hour and we're out of the county. It's it's not that far. The UK is a fairly small place generally. All right, we'll give everybody a few more minutes to join. I don't see Ed on yet. So Robert, I don't know if you want to do opening comments um, or not. Otherwise, whenever you I think will, we're ready, we'll, we'll turn Stuart loose. Thank you. I will leave it to you. You're the host. And I know, like I said, Jolie has some uh, youth scholarship students that are going to be presenting. So for those of you watch, I, Stuart, I have stick around. two and I told them to, they would be at the end, so. Okay, yeah, so everybody please stick around after after Stuart talks for the youth scholarship presentation. So, Becky, do you have anything good for the cause before we start? Well, uh, before we start or at the end, either way, I'm good with that. I just want to remind everybody that our beginning beekeeper class is coming up at the end of this month. If you would like to see the program, I would happily email it to you, check the buzzer, or look on our website, available all three places. And so I'm gonna guess that most of you people that are here tonight already have bees and maybe you don't think the beginning class is appropriate for you. And that could be the truth because we have some knowledgeable beekeepers. But that being said, make yourself a bee buddy and bring somebody to the beginning beekeeping class and you both will have gained information from it. It's always great to have somebody to work with. And our year two class is at the end of February. And if you've had bees less than five years or less, it's a class that is geared for you. So please sign up, sign up early. It helps us with our planning, appreciate it so much. And if anybody has questions about the classes, you could put them in the chat box and I'll try to monitor that. So that's it, there's my ad, thanks. Oh, sure. I, can I do one ad for Absolutely. the um, <laughs> for the value added uh, Kansas honey producers um, make more money with your bees and it'll be this Thursday the third Thursday of the month and this month we're moving into um, how you can make more money with your bees and Christy's going to talk about um, making nukes and making and selling nukes Christy Sanderson a member of this club so. I think it'll be really good. She does a great job with that. So, um, to if you haven't, if you haven't already um, signed up for them in the past, um, we sent an email out about a week ago, and you've gotten the link already. If you haven't ever signed up for them, go to the Kansas Honey Producers website and click on the link and sign up, and you'll get a link immediately. So, oh, well, thanks. Thanks, Jolie. It's free. Yeah, Stuart, we have, uh, we're fortunate in this area to have a lot of very, very long-term beekeepers, 30 plus years. I think Becky's been 30 plus, Jolie's been 30 plus, Robert, he posted a picture of a teenager. He's 30 plus, I'm guessing. <laughs> uh, I'm sure I'm missing a whole bunch of people that are 30 plus, but uh, we, we do have a lot of experienced beekeepers here. No so, pressure tonight then. 
No, pre no, no pressure at all. <laughs> thanks. <laughs> thanks for that, well, Matt. <laughs> okay, I actually, I'm going to have a poll here. So this is actually good. This would be a good poll. I don't know if you were going to talk about this. So go down to the bottom of the screen with your little reactions thing. We, I could have done an actual poll. But who has used a microscope before in, in beekeeping? Either just looking at a bee, doing nosema, doing tracheomites. Okay, I see one, two. All right, so a few people. I'm gonna guess it's uh, three fourths. Nikki, you're on. Uh, yeah, good. Yeah, I don't think, I don't think you know using a microscope or microscopy is very popular here in the U.S. Um, you know, I did it as part of, I did it as part of a program that I was doing and bought a little inexpensive microscope and I've seen a few people do it. So, all right. So welcome everybody. Um, if you haven't figured out right already, uh, tonight's guest speaker is Stuart Spinks. He runs Norfolk Honey Company out of Norfolk United Kingdom. Um, has a very popular YouTube channel you should check out. I don't know if you're gonna plug it, Stuart, but if you look for Norfolk Honey Company on YouTube, um, he has a lot of great videos, a lot of different techniques. Um, and so Stuart, uh, take it away. Right, <clears throat> thanks Matt. Um, hi everybody. Uh, Good morning. Uh, it's uh, just approaching five past one a.m. here. Um, it's uh, lovely to see you all. Um, so uh, what I'd like to do uh, in uh, how many hours do we have, Matt? Is it four hours? Um, is <laughs> Something to, like that. Is to go through microscopy from start to, to finish. <laughs> um, it's completely impossible for me to go through uh, all aspects of microscopy for beekeeping in a relatively short period of time. So what I'd like to do is to just go through some practical aspects of microscopy that everybody can get involved in, no matter uh, what your experience, no matter what size room you have. And uh, I mentioned the room because I'm going to show you exactly what my setup is uh, in a moment or two. Uh, I've put together a, a few slides just to introduce me and um, my background, and I'll just, I'm going to whiz through those really quickly. Tonight is um, really not about science, so if you're not into science and technical uh, microscopy, then this is for you, because microscopy for beekeepers really should be something simple, something that everybody can get involved in and particularly the world of pollen, because uh, grains of pollen are just the most fascinating things. And once you get involved in making up some microscopy slides with pollen, you can then move on to some of the more technical parts of microscopy for beekeeping, disease uh, diagnosis, that kind of thing. So uh, let me share my uh, screen and hopefully uh, we can we can kick off with uh, some slides. Uh, can I just confirm you're getting that okay, Matt? Yep, we're seeing it. Great, okay. Um, I've put 17th and 18th because it's the 18th uh, here. Um, so um, thank you for inviting me along. Um, hopefully um, you can make out this, this photograph. This is a, a scan of a photograph that was taken around 1989. And this is the very first swarm that I collected. And beekeeping back in those days was so much simpler. Uh, for me, I started with three beehives. Um, those have grown somewhat. <clears throat> and I've listed a wife, two daughters, two cats, a dog, and a career. Um, you'll be thrilled to know that I still have the same wife, the same two daughters, the cats, the dog and the career have all gone by the wayside, unfortunately. Um, but anyway, the more important aspects of my life are, well, one of them's fast asleep in the room next door, so I'm, I'm trying not to shout too loudly. Um, my introduction to beekeeping was on a very stormy day. A friend had just started beekeeping, uh, in, invited me over to uh, have a look at his beehive. We went down to the bottom of his garden uh, and took the top of the beehive off. He puffed a little bit of smoke at them. 
The bees didn't really want to be interfered with on that stormy day and boiled out of the top of the, what we call a crime board, you would call a cover board. Our crime boards here in the UK have a hole in the, the top uh, to, to put bee escapes and feeders on. And these bees boiled out of the top of the crime board. Uh, my beekeeping friend threw his smoker on the floor and yelled at me to run and he disappeared up the garden, leaving me stood beside a beehive with lots of angry bees suddenly coming out to, to see who was disturbing them. And that was my introduction to beekeeping. I ran up the garden. We ended up in his polytunnel uh, in fits of laughter because these two supposedly grown men had just run away from a, a box of tiny little insects. And from that point on, I was hooked. Um, jumping forward, um, wife, family and career all got in the way of my beekeeping career for a, for a while in the best possible way. Um, and eventually I came back to beekeeping a, a few years later uh, and went to uh, our local university to study a, a science degree in biology and ecology, which, uh, which I graduated from on my 50th birthday and set up a beekeeping society at that university. And then that evolved into a, a local association. Uh, from that point, I became a seasonal bee inspector. Here in the UK, we have um, a, a government department called the National Bee Unit, and uh, they have bee inspectors that go out to uh, amateur beekeepers and commercial bee farmers and inspect their colonies for disease. Here in the UK, we have two what, what are termed notifiable diseases, uh, American fowl brood and European fowl brood. And those are the, the ones that we tend to um, inspect for as bee inspectors and then deal with um, because of the high infection rates. And these are some photographs that I took uh, when I uh, visited a, a local beekeeper who had uh, an infection of European fowl brood. And you can see the kind of equipment that this guy was using. There's a couple of uh, cool boxes here that he's converted into nuke boxes. Um, uh, uh, this picture on the right is a, uh, a combination of several different hive types that would be used here in the UK. Uh, we seem to have a, a multitude of different hive types that everybody and anybody uses um, and they all say that they're the best and they just don't combine well. So uh, you end up with a, a stack of boxes that actually don't fit um, and what this guy had done is he'd nailed a plank to the bottom of one of the boxes to stop the bees from coming out the side because it didn't fit on top of the other one. Uh, and uh, yeah, so this, uh, this one on the left, I'm not too sure exactly what it is, but uh, I don't think um, Richard Branson or Elon Musk should be worried about um, rockets going into space from, from this character. I think um, he tried to launch it, but again, just a, a, a huge mess of different boxes. And this was his answer to a leaking gas bottle, just bung some tape on it. So as a bee inspector, you see some, some really strange and weird and wonderful things. But the serious part of the job was um, looking for disease. And if um, I know that we're talking microscopy and pollen this evening, but I thought uh, if you haven't seen American fowl brood, then this is quite a good image uh, and shows quite well what American fowl brood looks like when it's in the comb. So um, scales here of, of dead bees and larvae. This one, if you can, you probably won't be able to see because of the quality of the image, but this one actually has its tongue sticking out as it's died. And that's, that's a fairly obvious sign uh, of American fowl brood combined with all of the other aspects of the disease, the sunken, um, wet looking waxy cappings and things, but we had to burn it all. And this particular beekeeper had 40 colonies that we had to destroy because they were all full of American fowl brood. Uh, so I stepped into bee farming here in the UK. If you've got more than 30 or 40 beehives, you can call yourself a bee farmer. <clears throat> uh, we, we started 
our bee farming career i i guess i spent a lot of time inspecting other people's beehives um and not really giving enough time for my own so we decided to um stop the seasonal bee inspecting and to go into full-time commercial bee farming and this is uh, uh oilseed rape so this would be uh, probably in may um uh, canola and produces a really heavy nectar flow towards the end of its um, uh, flow. Uh, and Matt mentioned my uh, online videos and, and uh, presence online. Um, Patreon is a subscription site. We, we have about 200 or thereabouts videos on YouTube. Uh, on Patreon, uh, we've probably got another 300 videos. I think we've last late last year we uploaded our 500th video um, showing different techniques um, day-to-day beekeeping that kind of thing i have a weekly podcast which is called beekeeping short and sweet and uh, that goes out each week it's a short 15 minute um, uh, take on my beekeeping what we're doing different techniques uh, news uh, occasional interviews with people you can get the podcast on pretty much all of the um, podcast apps that are out there. We've got an Instagram feed. Uh, so if you want to see some photographs of what we get up to through the active season, we tend to post our photographs there. And as Matt said, the Norfolk Honey Company on YouTube uh, has around, I think it's around two, 250 um, videos, uh, again, taking uh, beginners all the way through to uh, more advanced techniques. So that's the uh, the slides sorted onto the practical uh, demonstration. <clears throat> so here's three slides um, that show different aspects of microscopy, things that you can get involved in. Uh, pollen on the left, I believe that's goldenrod, which you're possibly familiar with. Uh, we've got varroa mites in, in the middle picture, and then Nosema, very heavy infection of Nosema on the, the right-hand side. And so, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, so there are different uses for uh, microscopes, um, depending on what you want to actually um, look at, uh, investigate, uh, and explore. Uh, so I just need to stop sharing that screen and um, just move on to setting up the cameras and the like. Um, I did mention that this wasn't going to be technical and sciencey. Um, just one sciencey image, hopefully take everybody back to um, what we would call our junior school. Uh, the thing that we're really interested in this picture uh, is the stamen the male reproductive element of the plant. So we're looking for the pollen that's produced on the anthers. So that's really, um, when you look at any flower, that's the interesting part in terms of what the honeybee is all about and what the honeybee is looking for, uh, if it's going to that plant specifically for the pollen. Now, obviously, uh, at the bottom, there'll be nectaries that. Um, the bees will get the nectar from as well and the the whole trick of a flower in offering up that sugary substance is to get the bees to walk over this the stigma at the top which is where the pollen is deposited before it travels down the pollen tube uh, into the ovary so uh, that's the kind of science lesson i see we've got some uh, younger beekeepers with us. I hope that I got that all right. You're, you're probably on top of the anatomy of a, a flower. Uh, so uh, I'm just going to switch uh, to uh, my camera and microscopes, and then I'll give you a whiz round the room and show you exactly what we're we're looking at. Okay, so I'm, I'm literally going to lift the camera off 
um, my computer screen here just to show you. In fact, let's take this off first. So here's one computer, uh, one microscope, sorry. Uh, so this is a low power microscope. I'll lift it across and I can show you. So this is termed a trinocular microscope. Um, it's got three tubes. Uh, the one at the top is for adding a camera. And then you've got the two eyepiece tubes at the front, desperately trying not to drop it in front of you all. Um, so these are the eyepiece tubes. You can get microscopes with just one tube. Uh, and those tend to be, uh, should we say, better value. So they're, they're a little bit cheaper than a binocular microscope. Uh, what I tend to find uh, with a single monocular microscope, whether it be a high powered or a, uh, a dissecting or low powered microscope, is that if you're using it for a long period of time, your eye can get a little bit tired. Whereas with the binocular version, they tend to be a little bit um, less wearing on, on your eyes. So excuse the movement on the, the camera. Uh, so what we've got here is, uh, let's see, a cup of coffee to keep me awake and, uh, and our microscope. So we've got our compound or high powered microscope here. And most microscopes are constructed in a very similar way. Uh, so we've got a, a foot, we have a light source at the bottom a uh, focus wheel at the side here. Uh, this is the slide staging uh, and this a microscope slide fits. I don't know whether you can see the, the slide just here. Um, the slide fits in there and this arm is on a spring which holds it in place. Uh, and then we have the lens turret here which swivels round and has different lenses, uh, different powered lenses. And I'll talk about uh, the, the magnification on these in a moment. Uh, and then we have the eyepiece. And again, uh, we've got a third tube. And this is connected to a, a camera, which goes across and gets plugged into the, the computer. So oh, there we are. Uh, so. Um, with the, um, with the uh, optics and the turret that spins around, uh, generally speaking, you'll have four lenses. Some have three, some have four, and they all have different magnifications. So you'd start with a four times magnification, then go up to a 10 times magnification optic, a 40 times, and then a 100 times. Now, those don't sound as if they're going to give you a huge amount of magnification. But what you then have, and I can take one out, is the eyepiece. Uh, and this lens has a 10 times magnification on it. So all of the optics in the turret that's, that spin round are all magnified by 10 times. So the four times optic becomes a 40 times optic and and that scales up so we have 40 100 400 and then a thousand and the most that you're likely to ever need in terms of pollen is the 40 or 400 times and i'll show you some of the images that we have uh, that we can we can show you as we go through I'm just going to pour myself some water So what I've done uh, today is made up some pollen slides very, very quickly to show you uh, just how simple it is. It's not time consuming. If you just want to look at some uh, pollen to see where your bees have been uh, foraging. Just turn the camera on. Uh, and so uh, what we, tend to do, the reason I would look at pollen is to see what plants locally the bees have been foraging on, 
um, what pollens we might have in honey. Here in the UK, you can actually say that your honey is, for instance, borage honey or oilseed rape honey or lime honey. And the rules, uh, the honey regulations in the UK stipulate that it must have a majority of pollen from that particular source. So one way of providing that data, uh, should you be inspected, um, we, we have a, a department called the Trading Standards Department and Environmental Health, and they might give you a visit and say, well, your label says borage. How do you know that it's uh, borage honey? And if you can prove using a microscope that you've sampled it and that you've got a sample of borage pollen and it's predominantly borage, then generally they're okay with that. Uh, so uh, I'm just gonna open up another screen so we can get the, uh, the camera uh, looking down at uh, what I've got on the, the table. And then I can share that screen as well. So hopefully you can you can see the table. I'm just going to zoom it out a little bit. <clears throat> okay, so uh, what we've got on the the table in front of me are some of the bits and pieces that. Uh, you might need in order to produce a, a, a reasonable pollen slide. Now, I don't know um, what the quality of this image is like, whether I'll just try and um, get the focus. Uh, is that image okay? Can you see? Yeah, it's pretty good. Yeah, okay. <clears throat> so typically for, for beekeepers, um, you can start, uh, your journey into microscopy with a minimal amount of equipment, but actually there's a big box full of kit that you might buy, that you might like to buy. And of course, we all like gadgets. So eventually you'll end up with um, quite a large toolbox of, of bits and pieces. But I'm gonna just skip through some of the basics um, that you're gonna need. And I'll just move some of these into the picture so you, you can see clearly what we've got. So I'll start over this side. So we've got a little uh, cloth bag with various uh, tools in. So these are forceps, uh, we've got scissors. Uh, there's, there's a few uh, scalpel blades. Uh, these are called watch glasses and it doesn't show up terribly well on the, the, the white here, but it's basically a, a, a dish, a, a concave dish that looks like an old watch face. And we use that to uh, create our sampling. Uh, you'll need some microscope slides, uh, something called a cover glass, uh, and I'll explain what that is, but it basically protects the sample. Um, so isopropyl alcohol, I think it might be termed rubbing alcohol, uh, glycerin jelly, which is called a mantant, and this is the uh, liquid that the pollen is suspended in when you put it onto the microscope slide. And here in the UK, you can get it um, pre-stained. So this, if I move it over here, you can see that this is a pink color and that has some stain in it. The reason we use the stain is to increase the contrast of the various parts within uh, the pollen grain itself. And this bottle here, um, you might not be able to see what that says. It says saffron in, uh, and that's the stain, the specific stain that I use. There are others, but that's the stain that I use that gives a, a quite nice pink purple stain and it, it looks really good on the slides. Uh, now, what I'd like to do is to just show you uh, a slide that I prepared earlier. Let's see if we can drop that down. So here's a, a microscope slide. So this is the slide that was on the um, stage 
And you can see there's some pink dots and also some black circles. Now, if uh, you're short for time and you create a, a slide, these black circles are actually air bubbles. They're, they're tiny, tiny little air bubbles. Uh, and if you work too quickly, you can introduce air into your sample. So you have to take quite a lot of care when you're producing the, the slides. But you can see uh, the structure of some of the, the pollen slides here. Now, this is at, um, that's, that was 100 times. I'm just spinning the turret round to bring it into uh, 400 times. <clears throat> and then I'm just focusing uh, with the knob on the side of the microscope to try and find a sample to bring it into focus. So in, in this particular position, um, we've not got any pollen. So what I'll do is I'll spin it back and we take it back to uh, the previous slide. And I can now use the dials on the bottom of the stage to move the image until we find uh, something more appropriate. And you can see all of the bubbles. Um, so there we've got a sample. Now I know that this particular sample is Blackberry. And I'll try and center this this grain of pollen here and then we'll see if we can get that into the middle of the next slide so one of the issues when you're dealing with microscopy is that each time <clears throat> you step away from the image that's coming through the tube into the eyepiece, it, it degrades the image. So what we've got here, uh, hopefully you can see this image um, quite clearly, and I'll try to uh, point out some of the structures. So if you imagine, <clears throat> you might well have seen um, some CT scans of um, a brain and the way that they look through the image in slices as, as they go down and then back through the image. Well, that's basically what we're doing with our pollen slide. So you can see it's got this um, pink color, that's the stain. And then if I hold it just in that position, although it's a little bit out of focus, you might be able to detect a kind of triangular shape here, triangular shape there, and then a triangular shape there. Now that's the outside shell of the uh, pollen grain. It's called the exine. And the lighter areas that I've just focused down to, that you can see three lighter areas here. Those are the pores. And what happens is when the grain of pollen is taken into uh, the pollen tube, uh, the uh, pollen grain will extend from one of these openings and fertilize the flower. And that's where you get the seeds from. And you can see it quite clearly on uh, this slide over here. So let's bring up the other image again. And then I can show you how this was made. So what I've got here uh, is a sample of pollen. Again, I, I'm not sure quite how the quality looks for you guys there. Um, but these are, uh, this is pollen that I collected from the honeybees in the hive. So as they've gone into the hive, uh, they've gone through a screen and uh, these have been scraped off the bees, um, corbiculi, the pollen baskets at the back of the bee. And each one of these, generally speaking, tends to come from one um, flower source. And you can tell that by the, the individual colors. So with these, what we would do is take one of those tiny little grains and, and pop it into a, 
uh, a watch glass. If you can just see that we've got that tiny little uh, piece of pollen there. Now, there will be tens of thousands of grains of pollen in that sample, and that's all you really need. We then uh, wash it down with a little bit of water, uh, remove the water, evaporate the um, water off the pollen grains, and then add some isopropyl alcohol. The isopropyl alcohol removes all of the water from the sample. And when you dry the sample at that point, what happens is it tends to cause the pollen grain to collapse. But then when you add the stain, it reinflates the pollen grain and it absorbs all of the stain from the sample uh, that you've put in with it. So it, it makes the, the pollen a lot more uh, contrasty when, when you're looking at it under the slide. Uh, so that was how uh, the um, image of oh, wrong one how this image was created and I did that very very quickly um, this afternoon I'm just going to move these samples out of the way so I don't knock them over uh, my office here um, is approximately uh, six or seven feet wide by about four foot deep so it's a tiny tiny little office so you don't need a great deal of space in order to um, do a little bit of microscopy if anyone has any questions as i'm going if you want to to shout or if uh, if there's anything specific that you'd like to to pick up on then do do say so uh, okay so what i'd like to do um, next is to uh, produce a, a pollen slide for you and what I did uh, this afternoon uh, was to pop into the back garden and pick a flower. Uh, this is called a hellebore. I don't know if you're familiar with hellebores. Um, the bees will forage uh, on hellebores over winter if we get a mild day here. Uh, we'll often see the bees in the back garden on the hellebore. Um, we're a little bit early for snowdrops. That's one of my favourites to, to demonstrate that they're a nice little um, flower to, to do a demonstration on. Um, I've got a sample, again, of the hellebore um, pollen that I took this afternoon. And what I'll do is I'll just pull up that sample and show you the difference uh, between using the stain and the glycerin jelly that has the stain in it because it's it's quite a, a marked difference. Uh, so this is the slide, let's spin it round. So we're currently at 100 times magnification. And we've got um, a great big, um, so this is, this is an air bubble again. Um, but we've got some pollen grains here, and I'll see if I can centre this one at the top and uh, give you a, a better view of that one. Everything's back to front, so it's left to right and right to left and up and down and down and up. So when you're using the dial on the, the stage to move the image, it can get quite confusing. So let's spin this round. So we're now at 400 times magnification. Hopefully uh, we'll have an image here that we can uh, zoom in on. There it is. And I'll just recenter that. Okay, so, so this is uh, Hellebore. <clears throat> using the glycerin jelly with the stain already mixed into it. And you can already see that the definition isn't quite as good, but it's certainly good enough if you want to just do a quick check on some pollen that you've either found. Um, we have um, what are called open mesh floors here in the UK. Uh, so they have a bit of gauze or mesh in the bottom of the floor. And very often the bees, when they get into the hive, will drop pollen 
it'll fall through the the gauze onto the floor beneath and generally uh, I tend to have uh, a concrete paving slab underneath the hive stand and so the pollen will fall onto that uh, and we can uh, we can pick it up and and uh, bring it back and have a have a look at it so what you can see here uh, are uh, very similar in terms of the kind of structure of of the pollen grain it's a round pollen grain compared to the the blackberry and what i'm doing is i'm just focusing backwards and forwards to uh, look at all of the structures when you get to the midpoint um, it, I, I spoke earlier about a, a brain scan image when you get into the the center of the image you'll find that it shows the uh, structure of the outer casing of the pollen grain really well and that's where the stain comes in um, really well and stains the uh, outer edge so along this outer edge it's picked up the stain and again this the cell structure on the inner wall of the um, grain of pollen has picked it up quite nicely so you can see um, this is called the cytoplasm i'm not going to get into all of the technical details of, of pollen because i promised i wouldn't um, but you can see through the structure so i'm, I'm going from the top of the structure here all the way down and through to the bottom of the structure and it has a, a kind of a pitted mesh type um, net that that surrounds it and you've got these openings the apertures here again that you can see I, hopefully you're seeing this image as as well as i'm seeing it on my screen here so that was this afternoon's hellebore. So a very, very quick um, slide to produce. What I'm going to do now is just move that slide out of the way. And then we'll, we'll produce a slide. Uh, and uh, hopefully, we'll end up with um, something that looks um, half decent that we can see the the pollen grains again one of the reasons for taking a a pollen uh, slide a sample from a flower is that it gives you something that you can go back to uh, a point of reference so uh, a lot of the uh, if i just stop sharing for a second um a lot of the uh, books that are available out there so these are just a few of the the books that i have um the the rex sawyer book is very very good um but you might not have um the exact same flowers that are shown in those books as you would um have in your local area so you might have some very unique flowers in your area that you need to take a sample to, to have a reference point that you can go back to. So that's what we're, we're doing here. We're, we're taking a flower that I wouldn't normally maybe have a book that I could turn to that shows this particular pollen. And we can take a reference, keep that slide, um, treat it so that it becomes a permanent record. And I can show you some slides uh, when I finish this one that give you exactly that uh, and they'll last for many, many years. So all we're gonna do is carefully move the shot glass of water out of the way. And then this flower, if I hold it here, uh, we're going to kind of disassemble it really. Uh, and then put it into some isopropyl alcohol. So the first thing to do is to take a small amount of alcohol and we're going to basically wash the flour in this alcohol in order to wash the pollen from the, from the plant it's a very quick and simple way of of doing it so i'm just going to use my scissors to 
snip away at the base and literally just cut it away to make it a bit easier to put it into the watch glass. Let's move those out of the way. So uh, this is going to be loaded with pollen. So rather than trying to take it off there, all we do is dunk it into the alcohol and some of the pollen will wash away from the plant and be held in suspension in the alcohol. One of the nicest plants to try this with is dandelion. Uh, the dandelion gives so much pollen and it's a really nice yellow color. So when you take the sample, the alcohol actually appears bright yellow. So what we've got here, well, let's move it off this piece of white card. You might be able to see, you can't really see terribly well on the camera, um, but if I swirl it, you might just be able to pick up in the middle, there's a, a kind of a gray, patch you might just see that in the middle well that's going to be a lot there's going to be a lot of debris in there but there will also be quite a lot of pollen so what i have to do now uh, we're going to use the um, saffron in stain and the glycerin jelly which is is clear so i'll just move some of this out of the way what i need to do is to evaporate away the alcohol that we've we've got there so i'm just going to leave it on there the room will now fill of uh, alcohol fumes and I might pass out. So if I do, then you'll just have to talk amongst yourselves for a few minutes until I recover. So again, just to point out that little blue thing that he's setting that on is actually a warming station. Yeah, so um, this is a, a hot plate. I'm not terribly good at um, making things, so I tend to buy them. Um, Hot plates are one of those things that are quite, here in the UK, are quite difficult to get hold of. Um, we used to use a, a biscuit tin, a, a metal biscuit tin, um, and put a, a low wattage light bulb in, um, uh, and that would give enough heat on the, the base. So if you turn the tin upside down, it would give enough heat on the base. Um, but health and safety, uh, means that you can't do that any longer and you have to have something kind of um, made for the purpose. But I'm sure that there's plenty of you out there that, that could maybe make something very similar. So I'm just looking at this. Most of the alcohol is evaporated. It doesn't take very long at all. The other thing that's really useful, if, you, if you've got anybody that um, can get hold of some glass rod, I suppose this is about... Uh, six millimeters wide normally comes in a maybe a 30 centimeter length and if you use a gas torch to heat it up uh, it will glow in one particular point and you can pull it apart and then turn it into a little bulb at both ends and you can get an, a small bulb at one end and a, a bigger one at the other and that's really useful for kind of moving the sample of pollen around in the various liquids. So I don't know if you can see this um, uh, sample has gone quite light in color now. Um, let's, there we go. So we've got a sample of pollen sat in the middle of this uh, watch glass. There is actually just a little bit of alcohol still in there. So we'll just pop that back onto the hot plate just to evaporate that away. And we can get our, our stain ready. So the saffronin stain is the pink stain and it really does stain. So you have to mind your fingers when you're um, playing around with this stuff. Otherwise it will turn your fingers pink. And all I'm going to do is um, use the glass rod and dip it into 
Well, let's see if I can dip it into the bottle, draw it out and put a drop onto our watch glass. And then we'll just clean the glass rod a little. And now we need to just leave the, the stain to soak into the pollen. And what you can do um, is add a little bit of alcohol to loosen it up, to move it around. Always remember to put the lid on your stain because if that goes over on your desk, then you'll end up with uh, one heck of a mess. So I'll just get the alcohol. So depending on how long you leave the um, stain in the sample, uh, will affect exactly how long, uh, uh, sorry, how deep a colour you'll get in um, in your sample. So the longer you leave it, the, the deeper the colour. And you need to try and um, practice with it so that you can get just the right amount of stain in your sample uh, so that you can see all the structures without them being completely blown away by a, a dark pink colour. So let's just make a bit more space here. I'll use the other hand and then you can see what I'm doing. So I'm just swirling the alcohol around the sample just to move the stain into the sample. So the next thing to do is to uh, give this a rinse. So we use the alcohol again, so in the pipette here. So what I'm looking to do now is to wash away the excess stain from the sample so that it um, is taken up by the pollen grains, but all of the excess stain that we've got in the sample here gets washed away and reveals the, the structure of the, the pollen grain. So you can use the glass rod just to break up some of the clumps. So what's happened is that some of the pollen has stuck together with the stain so we can just move it around but in this sample I can see that there's lots of pollen grains in the bottom of this sample so if I swirl it you can perhaps see the dark area in the middle that's where the the pollen is <clears throat> so the next task is to remove all of the excess alcohol and we use that by using some uh, you can either use um, coffee filter is a, a, a good option. Kitchen towel is a, a good option, the stuff that you would use to mop up spills. And you can see how quickly the capillary action draws it up into the tissue. Um, but if you use uh, either of those, you need to make sure that you cut small squares rather than tearing it, because if you tear it, you'll end up with um, fibres, I don't know whether you can see it, but there's lots of loose fibres on the end of this tear. Rather than being a nice straight cut, you end up with lots of fibres and some of those fibres can transfer into your sample. So you don't want to, to tear it up, you need to, to cut it with some scissors. So I'll just continue to draw up some of this uh, excess alcohol and I'm, I'm being fairly brutal here just to um, be as quick as I can. And undoubtedly some of the sample will get drawn up in, into the tissue, uh, but we've got plenty of pollen, <clears throat> or we appear to have plenty of pollen, um, so that we can, um, we can more or less guarantee we'll have a sample. So this now goes back onto the hot plate just to evaporate the rest of the alcohol away. And it will gradually become lighter in color as, um, as the alcohol evaporates. So 
So once we um, have the um, sample fully evaporated, uh, what's happening now is that the grains of pollen are actually shrinking uh, and they become quite distorted. So if we were to put that sample onto a microscope slide without using the glycerin jelly, you wouldn't really recognize the grains of pollen. They'd all be um, twisted and they wouldn't look uh, as they should. Using the glycerin jelly reinflates the sample back to its original state uh, and original structure. So you can then see exactly what, uh, what it should look like. So I'm just gonna wipe down the outside edge of our watch glass. just to remove uh, any additional uh, alcohol and also the stain. And you can see the stain that was uh, on there. So the, uh, the sample is now uh, drying out and those grains of pollen are kind of um, shriveling up and being compressed. <clears throat> the next thing to do is to get uh, uh, a microscope slide warmed up and also a covered glass. Now the covered glass is re a really important part of what we're doing here and it serves two purposes really. Uh, the first purpose is that it protects the sample. So when you put your sample on a microscope slide and this is not gonna, <laughs> not gonna come apart, there we go. Um, when you put the sample on a microscope, if you wind your objective lenses down too far and end up touching your sample, you'll contaminate the lens and it will be really difficult to clean. So uh, we use a, a cover slip in order to protect uh, not just the sample, but also the microscope. But what it also does, if you don't put too much of a sample onto your microscope slide. When you put your cover slip on top, it actually serves to um, draw the sample out into a very thin layer. So almost uh, one pollen grain thick. And if you put too much of your sample onto the microscope slide, you end up with uh, quite a thick layer of glycerin jelly. And that in itself, Will make it difficult for you to focus on because the um, sample will be spread and um, when we're looking at it through the microscope the depth of field the area that's actually in focus uh, is very narrow and so if you've got multiple layers of pollen stacked on top of each other it can be quite difficult to see so we've got our cover glass i've just given it a little bit of a wipe just to clean it up Let's pop the lid back on here. And next we need to um, put our glycerin jelly in. I'm just going to wash the end of the um, little glass rod because we don't want to contaminate any of our um, equipment. So. Uh, Cross-contamination can be a real problem. So if you double dip, if you put your um, little glass rod into a sample and then go back into the glycerin jelly because you've not put enough on, uh, in fact, what you can do is put some of your sample into your glycerin jelly. So the next sample that you check will end up being contaminated by the previous sample. So you need to make sure that everything's nice and clean. Okay, so now we need to take the top off the glycerin jelly. And what we're going to do is to, oh, let's try and do this so that you can see what I'm doing. So we're gonna put a couple of drops onto our sample. So I'm holding it high and just shaking the glass rod to get the glycerin jelly just to drop down onto the sample. 
rather than putting the rod into the sample and then coming back into the jar. Pop that lid on. Hopefully our, our one sample will be sufficient. If you were making these up for reference, then you'd want to probably make uh, maybe five or six so that you can then select the best one. Now this is the critical bit, and this is the bit that always introduces air bubbles if you're too quick. So what we need to do is to just gently move the glass rod into the sample to get the pollen to take up the glycerin jelly and to reinflate themselves. Uh, but in doing so, you can incorporate quite a lot of um, air bubbles into the sample. And even just moving the glass rod gently like this, I'm probably going to be introducing some um, air bubbles into our, our sample, but hopefully not too many. So now we have uh, our clear glycerin jelly with our stained sample. Um, what I then need to do is to get the uh, microscope slide. Uh, this is a, I don't know if you can see, it might be blown out. So it's just a simple guide. Um, what I've got in the middle is the shape of a microscope slide. And there's a little dot right in the middle, which is the dead center. And that's where I want to put my sample, because if I'm going to save this as a reference, then I need to put a circular cover slip on it and then paint around the edge to seal the cover slip to the microscope slide. So it's important that I have it in the, the center. So I'll just go ahead and demonstrate doing this. So off the hot plate, so we've got a warm microscope slide. Take up a quite a reasonable sample. So I spin the glass rod as I come off and then deposit it in the middle and just very gently make a circle. So there you can see, hopefully, that we have our sample in the, the middle of that um, slide. Move things around a little bit here. If I turn this guide over, you might be able to see it a little bit better. Uh, so then what I need to do is just pop this back onto the hot plate to keep the glycerin jelly liquid. It, as soon as it comes off the hot plate, it will start to solidify again and it makes it difficult when you're putting the cover slip on. So uh, next I want to find uh, the right forceps to be able to pick up the cover slip. So the cover slips are really, really thin. So uh, naught point, well these are 13, 130 microns thick, so 0.13 millimeters. So off onto off the hot plate onto our guide, and then I'm just going to lay the cover slip down until it touches the sample, and then release it down. Push it so that it's square on the microscope slide. and then back onto the hot plate. Now, I don't know if you can, can see, but there's a, a circular area that is our sample. But now that I've put it back on the hot plate, what will happen is capillary action will draw the sample from its position across into the rest of the um, cover slip area. So we give that 30 seconds uh, to a minute and it will gradually um, spread itself out. Again, if you're making a sample that you want as a reference, uh, you want to put an adequate amount of uh, sample on your slide so that it stretches right to the edge of, of the cover slip area. But because we're just um, putting together a sample uh, to have a quick look at, then it's not quite so much of a problem for us. So I'm just repositioning the cover slip. Okay, so I think we can probably 
um, cross our fingers and pop this onto the microscope and see if we've got an image that we can uh, take a look at. Okay. So I mentioned the air bubbles. You can see immediately, even with it's not being in focus, that we've got air bubbles everywhere. Uh, but you can see um, the, the grains of pollen and the way that they've absorbed all of that stain. So this is the four times objective with the 10 times eyepiece magnification. So that's 40 times magnification. And you can see that uh, we've got um, some really well stained uh, pollen grains here. Uh, I, what I'm doing uh, is just looking for uh, one that gives us a good view of the structure. And I'm just going to position uh, the slide so that uh, I'm actually looking specifically at this pollen grain here. This is the one that looks like it's got quite a nice structure to it so that we can get into that one. So next we go from 40 times to 100 times magnification. Wait for the camera to uh, sort itself out and then we can focus in. In fact, we've got a real, there's a really nice one. Uh, that's the one that I was looking at, but there's a, a really good looking image at the bottom here. So we could reposition ourselves uh, for that one. Remembering everything's back to front. And then again, I'll switch to the 400 times. And then we'll try to focus this in. Okay, so we've got our two. If I move the image slightly, we might be able to get both of those in. There we go. So everything, every tiny little movement is obviously magnified at 400 times. So <clears throat> here we've got our hellebore sample, and you can see from the original magnification the 40 times, just how much pollen came off that one flower. And we have a really nice example of the structure here. Now, looking at it um, as I am here, it's probably still got too much stain in it. So it could probably have been washed a couple of times with some uh, alcohol just to wash out some more of the stain but you can see the structure uh, quite nicely and particularly uh, the larger pollen grain above. Um, you can see the various structures as we, as we go through the, the focusing. Uh, but here at the bottom, we've again got quite a nice image of the pores that it has. Uh, if, any, if anybody's interested, the outside um, casing of the pollen is called the exine. And on that, you might get a range of different um, shapes. So you could have spines, you could have pillars, uh, you could have blocks on it, uh, semicircles, a whole range depending on the type of pollen that you're looking at. And internally, the, the dark line on the inside is called the intine. And that's the inner edge of the, the shell of the, the grain of pollen. And again, you can see the pores that we have um, quite clearly, and this uh, really lovely shape to the outer shell. So there's our um, hellebore sample. Uh, what I will do now is just grab a, some of the slides that I've produced before. Um, so uh, here in the UK, we have um, the British Beekeepers Association, uh, and they run a range of different um, assessments, uh, modules that as a beekeeper you can take. Um, 
I'm really not a fan of exams. Uh, having done a degree course, that was more than enough for me. Um, but the microscopy assessment is very practical. And so in order to, in fact, let me turn the camera on again because I can show you the slides via the, the camera. Um, in order to take the microscopy assessment, you have to produce a range of um, slides. And these were the samples um, that I produced uh, for that assessment. <clears throat> so what we've got here are different um, pollen grains, uh, all encapsulated uh, with a cover slip. And then there's a couple of um, B parts. <clears throat> and there's also a slide um, of um, honeybee sperm, which I created. Uh, but let me show you uh, this one at the bottom, which is hazel. Hazel is quite interesting because the pollen grains actually tend to be very um, specifically sized throughout um, all of the samples, uh, and they tend to be 25 microns in, in diameter. So you can use them uh, very much as a, a sample against other um, other pollen grains to give you the, the right sizing. So, and hey, Stuart, is, if I can jump in and give you maybe yeah. a, another five minutes or so, I don't know how much yeah, more. <laughs> nearly, nearly done. Okay, great. Thanks. Um, this is really good. I mean, I could listen to you for four hours, but I'm not sure everybody else can. <laughs> yeah, sorry, folks. Uh, so, here's, here's, um, here's Hazel. Um, and again, you can possibly make out the structure uh, of the um, pollen grains here. There's a light area just here, which is the pore, and you can see it on some of these others. And this one at the top here has the three, um, three pores showing quite clearly. And that is my um, microscopy for beekeepers. Um, it's a, it is a lot of fun. If you can find yourself some microscopes and give it a go, then I would recommend it because it it's such a an insightful way of looking at what our bees are up to and and seeing uh, exactly the type of pollens that our, our bees are foraging on. Do you have on your YouTube channel by chance how to uh, extract pollen from honey? You know, using a centrifuge and all that stuff. Or... Uh, I no, I don't. Um, and I, okay. I don't actually use a centrifuge. The easiest way to do it is to take a sample of honey, pop it into um, some kind of test tube. Um, you could even put it into a, a jar. But if you took a, a sample, um, it doesn't have to be much, maybe a um, uh, quarter of a teaspoon. Mix it in with some water, put it into a tube, give it a good shake and then set it aside and, and let it settle, the pollen will settle out to the bottom. Uh, you can then use a pipette to draw off the uh, water honey solution, get to the bottom, put that onto your watch glass and then go through the process of producing a slide from that. Okay, I wish I would have asked that question months ago because I've been, I've been shopping for a centrifuge because that's how everybody on YouTube does it. So that seems like a much easier way to do it. Uh, and cheaper. It, yes, exactly. <laughs> Great. Anybody have any questions for uh, for Stuart? I didn't see anything in the chat. I I just put one in there, but I'll speak. Okay. Um, I I'm I just find this fascinating, and I only have four hives, but I still like science. <laughs> what what where where would I go, and what would I have to spend to get something that would let me look? Do you have any idea? Of course, you're over in the UK. It's probably different but um i'm more interested in looking at bees than i am pollen uh but uh and i realize i had to learn a lot is that but, barbie is that barbie speaking yes yeah hi um i honestly your best bet is probably going to be somewhere like amazon um you don't have to use um equipment like this in order to get a close-up of bees, um, you can 
in, in fact, you can get apps for a mobile phone. Um, you can uh, get little tripods for mo mobile phones. Um, and using an app, you can zoom in on the B. The image that I showed of the um, three different slides, the Varroa mites, um, that uh, in itself is not something that you would necessarily need to have um, a microscope for. You can zoom in uh, on a Varroa mite quite easily um, with a mobile phone. So you, you can get started very, very cheaply and uh, easily. If you wanted a, a high powered microscope, 100 to $150 new <clears throat> would probably get you something, uh, a monocular type microscope. Uh, eBay, you could probably pick some up there. Lots of um, universities, certainly here in the UK, tend to sell uh, older stock. So they tend to pop up on, on eBay quite frequently or there are specific resellers of university equipment, particularly microscopes. So you might be able to find something like that over there in the States. Well, that would be great. I thought I'd probably have to spend thousands. I, di I didn't have any idea. Um, yeah, Barbie, I bought a, I think it was a fairly inexpensive $100 microscope off of Amazon. Really? Um, wow. Yeah. And then you can see them on Facebook Marketplace quite a bit. Like as Stuart said, a lot of universities or schools you know, sell them. Um, there's a there's a microscope guy in Kansas City. I don't know where you're at, but he does microscope repairs. He might, if I can find his name, I'll post it in the group. But yeah, it doesn't it doesn't take much. I think the biggest thing I found is to, like trying to find the glycerin and the stain. As a, yeah. although I know you can make the glycerin and the stain, but well, great. Well, Stuart, yeah, thank um, you very just, much. Just on the the stains and that kind of thing. Uh, if you do get stuck, then drop me a message. Um, we often pop over and visit our daughter in Pennsylvania and she comes to see us. So I don't mind um, popping some in the suitcase and bringing it over and getting it sent over to you. So it's not a problem. Great. Thank you. Get stopped at customs probably, but hey. <laughs> Suspicious things in a bottle. <laughs> yeah, exactly. All right. Yeah, and if anybody has any uh, follow up, or if you think of something in the middle of the night, you know, you can send me an email or or drop it in the Facebook group, and I'll make sure we get it sent over to uh, to Stuart. So, thank you much, sir. Very appreciative. You're very welcome, Jolie. I will turn it over to you. Hopefully, our our young ones aren't falling asleep yet. Oh, that was great. I'm still here, Matt. Oh, good, Stuart. We're really good friends with um. Brian and Pat um, Sheriff. They're both okay. past, but we were also really good friends with Angie and we were there. Um, we stocked the sheriff suits for them for about 20 years. So great piece suits, yeah. Yep. We saw some in your photos. So, okay, I have two kids who are going to present tonight um, Branson Sailor and um, Kylie Barrett. And so who wants to go first? Kylie, I see your grandpa's Wait, on. I, I thought I was presenting tonight too. Oh, we have three kids tonight. Sorry. I didn't have you down. You want to go first, Daniel, since you're on? Yeah, sure. Okay. Is it? showing correctly it is you're doing great and we can hear you real nicely okay hello my name is daniel Klinger. first i would like to start by thanking everyone that made this scholarship possible and that put in the time to help me learn how to be a beekeeper i would especially like to thank my mentor larry Kovinger and my family for their amazing support and encouragement my journey through beekeeping started when my dad showed me an application for a scholarship through Nevka. I had been interested in beekeeping for a while, but the idea of a scholarship and a mentor helped jumpstart my interest. So after filling out an application, we submitted it. A couple of months later, we were notified that the scholarship was granted. The equipment arrived uh, via mail late February. 
The day we opened it felt like Christmas. Over the next couple of weeks, uh, sorry. Over the next couple of weeks, we put the equipment together, primed it, and painted it. It was a very involved and exciting process. So here's some photos of, we had a jig that we bought and that made the process go a lot easier because you could just slide everything in and glue it and nail it. And then painting. So you can see this was it all primed. The outer and inner cover, it was, really tricky to get all the little nails in without bending them. So I had to re-bend a couple of nails because they just snapped in half. So that was fun. And then installing the package. Um, well, first, sorry. My dad received, he bought equipment at the same time I did so that we could learn at the same time with my mentor, Larry. Um, so, sorry, I'm a mess. Okay. I met my, Mary, my mentor, Larry Covinger, for the first time in person early March to discuss mm -hmm. hive placement and how and when the package would arrive. When the package mm -hmm. arrived, Larry proceeded to show me how to install it. So... This is a little video of us putting it. Dump it in. Turn it over and dump it and shake up and turn it that way. And shake it and turn it back I was a little bit nervous. <laughs> Push the bees. Just shake it in as many as you can get in. There. They can go in between these frames wherever they want to go. But we want to get as many in there as we can. Okay, let's let's do that. That's you. Then we proceeded to check for Varroa mites. The mite level was extremely low. Also a sugar feeder was placed on the top of the hive. We then marked the queen. You can see in this photo. So when you put it in the tube, I was afraid you'd squish the queen because like you have to slide it up just right. So, and then we marked the, queen that we got in the mail white because that was the year and here's some enlarged pictures of the queen and then we realized that the queen was having she was her brood pattern was really weird so we actually saw some supersedure cells and they just decided to supersede and here is the new queen after she's been marked. It did take a while for the queen to go out and get mated and start laying. So the brood numbers, you know, dropped for a while. Um, when we went to mark the new queen, we realized there was a couple of cells that hadn't hatched. So we removed those and we put them in a jar to see if they would hatch. And actually, when we were putting them in the jar, one of the queen cells hatched right in front of us. It was, it was amazing. Larry said he had never seen anything like it. It, it, was, it was just amazing. And we used that queen to start a nuke. And the nuke's actually doing really well. So that was interesting. And so winter prep. We checked the weight of the hive and we realized that uh, the large hive was doing extremely well, but the nuke was a little bit low on resources. So we built a spacer and made some sugar patties. So we put some sugar patties. Um, and my siblings all got bee suits. So you can see in the photos, they're all helping. And my little sister, she's three years old. She, she just loves the bees. And she was always trying to get in the bees. So we had to make sure to get her a suit because she would get stung. So um, 
Uh, again, thank you to everyone that made my scholarship possible and that is continuing their support. Um, even though I had Queen Troubles, it ended up to be a very good year. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Great job, Daniel. Yes, everyone had Queen Troubles last year. So <laughs> everyone got a lot of good experience with whatever. So um, Kylie, do you want to go next? So Kylie's grandfather, Larry Coppinger, was Daniel's mentor. So that worked out pretty good. Because Anyway, thank you, Daniel. You did a great job. And your family is one of those we just love when the whole family gets involved. And, and I can go next. Good. All right. You're on. So this is Kylie. Kylie from way down south. Hey, Kylie, start over because you're on mute. Can you guys see it? We can see it and now we can hear you. So we haven't heard you till just now. Okay. Okay. Beginning Beekeeping by Kylie Barlett. This is my first year of beekeeping. And I started by looking at one of my grandpa's hives and my grandma told me that I should apply for a scholarship. So I did. So first I had to build the hives and I started this year with two hives, one for me and one for my dad. And the first step was to build the hives by gluing them, nailing them together and then painting them. Moving in, my mentor Neil helped me move in my bees. I sprayed them with sugar water so that they couldn't fly and they would just fall right into their new home. I had some queen troubles because one of the queens wasn't doing very good. So we replaced her and with no luck, we had to replace her again. And my grandpa helped me mark my queen so that it'd be easier to find them. After my, the third queen was replaced, we decided to combine the hives. We put newspaper in between them and cut slits so that they wouldn't kill each other and get used to each other since. And after about a week or two, I took out the remaining newspaper. Filling frames. The new hive was doing great at building out wax, putting brood in frames, and putting lots of honey. Checking for mites. We did an alcohol test, and there was about eight to nine mites in 100 of my bees. So I put an apple guard in the hive for a month, and my mentor, Neil, helped me vaporize them after that. Winter feeding. I gave my bees pollen substitute and sugar cakes in the winter, and they're doing really good. I got to learn how to make soaps and lotions, and they were great Christmas presents for my friends and teachers. Thank you so much for the scholarship, and I can't wait until next year. Great job, Kylie. Yep, see what I mean? Everyone had queen problems. So, well, you did great and your whole family was definitely involved in that too. So we, we really appreciate that. So good job and I'm glad you're interested in sticking with beekeeping, so. All right, next is Branson Sailor. Branson's from Princeton and um, are you ready, Branson? Yes. All right, you're on. Oh. Oh, it's okay. Just... Yeah, I, have, um, I don't know how to do it. Do, I don't know how to screen share. Right here, Mom. Okay. Do that. Never mind. I've, we found it. Right. 
if you don't know how to do it. No way to not go on the screen. I can't know. Um, Branson, do you need Robert to help you with anything? Yes. Can you tell him what you yes. need? Is he able to share his screen, Robert? Sure. What device are you on, Branson? A laptop? I'm on an iPad. Okay. <clears throat> Down at the bottom of your uh, iPad. Got it. Okay, so if you go down, arrow down to the bottom of screen of your uh, Zoom, you should see in the middle of, uh, an option that says share screen. But first, you want to make sure that you have your uh, PowerPoint program open. And ready to go. Take your time. Uh, the camera. Uh, the camera. Oh, Hang on, I'm trying to fix something. Hey. Okay. So I'm trying to. He's got a multi-page. Um, this is got a multi-page PDF. It doesn't have PowerPoint. Well, I thought if he shared screen, he could just pull it up. Yes. So where's the where's his program saved? In yeah. The cloud? That's what Robert told us. Okay. Yeah. Robert needs to walk you through it because because so, I don't know anything. Yeah. Um. Are you? Can you email me the program real quick? Right now. We're sending it right now. We just sent it. Okay. While they're getting that set up, this year we'll have six new youth scholarship students and they'll be attending the new beekeeper class. And that's usually how we get introduced to them. Um, last year our class was by Zoom, so we didn't really get to meet them all year except for these presentations because we really haven't been together as a group. So um we're, anyway but all the kids so far have been really excited and really interested in keeping on with beekeeping and that's kind of our goal is to get families involved so that we carry beekeeping on so Dolly, you just reminded me of something um douglas county has implemented a mask policy again for uh, the city of Lawrence, any inside area is mask mandated. And so we will respect their mandates and everyone who attends the new beekeeping class will be expected to wear a mask indoors. Now that said, we're going to be eating. We're going to have box lunches so that you can easily pick up your lunch and move away from each other as you need to. But um, while the class is going on and we're just sitting there, we're all going to wear masks. The speakers will not be masking so that you can hear them well, but everyone else will be wearing a mask. So don't be surprised. And if you don't have a mask, we'll, we will kindly offer you one, but uh, we're going to just try to keep everybody safe. Thanks. Just wanted to let people know ahead of time. I don't want surprises. Thank you. Thank you. Just a minute here.
Robert, we're so thankful we have you. Oh, thanks. Let's see if we can get this. Well, we will be if you get this worked out. <laughs> I second that. That's, yeah. There we go. And you should know how many times the, our speakers have had this same issue of one sort or another. It is so common and it makes my heart feel good that it happening to a young person and it's not just an old people problem. So That's thank right. you. We have had national speakers <laughs> that we've had to go through this with. So, all right, good job. Okay, Daniel, you you take it away. Okay, Daniel, it looks like this came in as a PDF, and I have four pages of it. No, no, it, it Daniel, I mean me. Branson, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Branson. Branson, sorry. Do you want to Can anybody hear me? We can hear you. Can you see me? Hear me. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, proceed. Okay. Um, hang on, I'm just waiting to, okay. Uh, would you mind going to the next slide? Can you hear me? This one? And um, yes, the one with all the shapes. This one. My name is Branson Saylor. I am a youth scholarship recipient and have been keeping bees since April. I've always been fascinated with bees and I always wondered why are bee cells or honeycomb in the shape of hexagons? So I decided to do some investigating and here's what I found. Let's see. Bees have been using hexagonal comb for the whole history of honey. But why not circle, I ask, having some reference images. As you can see on the visual example, the red represents wasted space that bees can't fit into, just like how triangles waste storage space when touching the bird or say the high frame. So triangles could be I know the holes between the triangles could be used as tunnels, but who needs that many tunnels? Even with that big of a population, that many tunnels seems a bit overboard. So why not seal it up with honeycomb? That would just waste more wax. But the square wastes no space at all, you might say. That is a good, good point, but the hexagon does it better. To put it simply, hexagons have the least given and bees tend to favor that characteristic. The comb building process is carried out by bees with the assistance of temperature and mathematics. It starts when a bee secretes wax skin from its abdomen. The wax is meant to be a circle, but is warm and starts to expand into a shape that it has even sides and angles. Each angle is 120 degrees when three rods are connected with 120 degree angles between each rod, it forms a very strong bond. Next slide, please. One. That one, thank you. The hexagon shape is strong and appears to be popular in nature, not just for bees. For example, snowflakes can be hexagonal if you were to connect the tips of the ice. Some of the basalt columns that make up the giant's causeway in Northern Ireland are hexagonal. And even Saturn picked up on the trend and has a hexagonal storm above it. Fourth slide, please. Next 
as long as I can get it to go. As you know, beekeepers keep bees for numerous reasons. As you know, beekeepers keep beekeepers keep bees for numerous reasons. Some do it for side income, while others just do it as a hobby. But what most do is provide a fashion for the bees to build on, made of wax hexagons. This for the bees we keep so they don't have to work as hard because it takes roughly 8.4 ounces and pounds of honey to make one pound of wax. And bees still need honey as a food source. So the least we can do is provide a foundation for them. Since honey is a liquid, it should fall out of the cells, right? Wrong. These well, the cells are slanted upward to prevent that problem from occurring. If the comb was not slanted, then the colony would have a harder time surviving. These cells of honeycomb are used in a multi-purpose space. They can be used as egg and larva homes or food storage for pollen. Essentially, the bees use hexagons for the hexagons for everything. Here are some pictures of my bees and their hexagons. So, to conclude, hexagons are the best agons. Thank you. Very good. Great job, Branson. Great recovery. Well, Cecil and I were Branson's mentors, and we were astounded every time that he had like the best eyesight. He could see stuff in his hive that we couldn't see. So he he did a great job and um, his hive swarmed. I mean, he had about everything too. So it's been an interesting year for most of the kids. So that's really all Thank I you, Thank Cecil, you, Branson. For being such good mentors. Say it again. Well, we Thank tried. You, Jolie and Cecil for being <laughs> such. <laughs> Thanks, Branson. Good job. Nikki commented that the title of What the Hex was worth the wait. She loved it. So that was good. Thank you. Anyway, anyone else have anything? Any other kids I forgot we're presenting tonight? All right. Thank you. Yep. Matthew, anything else? What's next month? Uh, so next month is another Stuart. Um, Stuart Dietz is going to be talking about sort of a little bit of beekeeping history in Kansas and some of the larger bee producers that have been around in Kansas. And that's our February meeting and that will be at Douglas County, correct? We are that is correct. Unless not, something changes. <laughs> we are we are not zooming next month. Very good. All right. And don't forget Thursday, I'll send out an email out um, about our Kansas honey producers value added that Jolie mentioned at the beginning. Very good. Night, everyone. Have a good, good night. Stay warm. Thanks for joining.